as well, so that's good. Uh, okay, yeah, um, I'm going to talk, I hope, slightly coherently about an article that I published recently uh, in the ISJ, Socialist Workers' Party uh, journal, who let me publish something on this, quite nice of them. Um, and I think it's quite, well, I don't know, I don't know what to, it's, it, you can often read things into, you know, why certain things have been published at certain times. I think it's quite interesting that they let me publish this article right now. Uh, because I think there has been recently, as I say in the article, um, a revival of uh, quite big uh, questions about strategy, about socialist strategy. Uh, and we're going back to sort of, in many ways, old questions, but unanswered questions about, you know, what is the relationship between socialists, or what, should, what ought to be, or what could be the relationship between socialists, the state, uh, reform and, and revolution. Um, and I think that uh, we're, we're sort of going back to debates that have been largely absent over the last three decades, but they're coming back in interesting ways. And I think there are several reasons for uh, this sort of revival or resuscitation of an old debate. Um, first of all, you know, clearly uh, the left is reinvigorated but disoriented at the same time by the crisis, uh, by the, um, I don't know, is it a failure of the left to capitalise on the, on the crisis? Uh, the, the sense that uh, the, the, the sort of established social democratic party of the left across Europe, not just in Britain now, are in a, in a process of decomposition, uh, are, are degenerating, uh, are seen as sort of, you know, uh, simply in, uh, kind of enforcing the austerity agenda themselves, no different to the Conservative parties um, and so on. Um, and so this has opened up a space to their left. And so this has opened up a debate amongst the radical left about, you know, well, how do we take advantage of this? How do we actually fill this gap? There is this opportunity, and how do we use it? Secondly, and relatedly, the rise of Syriza in Greece, for all their problems, I'm not, I'm not a cheerleader for Syriza, but I think they're, you know, a hugely welcome development, um, and I support them uh, critically. Uh, their, their sort of dramatic rise to now be, you know, they're widely seen as a, a, a government in waiting in Greece, possibly, uh, and this is, you know, it's a big thing. Who'd have thought this ten years ago that there'd be a Marxist, uh, a group, an anti-capitalist, socialist party, anti-austerity party on the verge of taking power in a European country? And so clearly, this too has reinvigorated the left. It's given us hope. It's also raised awkward questions about, well, what happens? What if the worst happens for many people and Syriza wins power? In fact, that's the worst thing for some people in Syriza. What happens if they take power? You know, it kind of raises all sorts of obvious problems. It raises the old debate about reform, revolution, the kind of the character of the capitalist state, and so on. What you can do, how far you can push things. And the third, uh, I think, the third factor is the crisis in the SWP, uh, which is, you know, whatever you think about it and whatever has caused it, and various various things, some, you know, less pleasant than others, uh, it's freed up the terrain to some extent on on the on the left. I think in quite positive ways. I wouldn't want to see the SWP disappear. I think if it does, it would be a disaster, actually, for the far left in this country. But it has opened up the debate. Um, the second aspect of this is that within... One of the reasons why things like left reformism, and I, I'm sort of apparently uh, touted around as, as a left reformist or a centrist or something like this, um, this these, these kind of old terms have, have, have also reappeared quite, quite recently. And I think often in SWP... Uh, presentations at Marxism, people were warning, for example, about the dangers of left reformism. Uh, there have been several publications in SWP uh, 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 journals and, and magazines and so on about left reformism and why it's wrong and why we should not, we should, we shouldn't do it and so on. Um, that's that's kind of raised the question, but I think it's also worth saying that I think that these, this term has been used in a sort of internal disciplinary way. The sort of the tactic behind it is to sort of raise the, you know, the, this incorrect strategy and to use it as a, as a, as a way of kind of uh, keeping, holding the line within the party. I think there's, there's a lot of, kind of internal manoeuvring going on. Uh, and often the debate between the revolutionary socialists on the one hand and, and the left reformists on the other is actually an internal debate within the SWP by kind of proxy. Anyway, um, also you, actually it's interesting to see a revival of the term Eurocommunist, who I think Richard Seymour is now an arch-Eurocommunist and that's a bad thing. Um, I think that the way that the term left reformism, and this is, a, this is the term I think that the debate pivots on uh, in many ways at the moment, or, or part of the debate on, on strategy, uh, the way it's used is unhelpful. I don't want to go through the details of this, I don't have time, but in Paul Blackledge's article, and John Molyneux writes something for Irish Marxist Review, uh, 
and also Mark Thomas's article in the Socialist Review, where they, they bring up this term left reformism. I think it's used in a, quite a slippery way, not necessarily intentionally, but I think it's very problematic. And I'll go into that more in my article, I won't go into that now. One of the big reasons, I think, why the SWP is getting quite exercised about left reformism is also the rise of left unity, which I think is there's kind of remarkable ambiguity in SWP. Uh, I don't want to kind of, I'm not trying to bash the SWP, by the way. I have quite a good relationship with many people in it. Uh, but they, they are a major force on the left. I think that there's, there's, there's quite a, a remarkable ambiguity in relation to it. They want to be part of it, and yet they see it as a threat, and they think they're being excluded, and so on. I, I think that's part of what the debate's about, too. Um, what I want to do, and what I, what I do in the article, uh, is defend, so that's the kind of the context. What I try to do is defend the idea of a left government, or in the, in the, in the, in the uh, phrase of the common turn, I draw very heavily on John Riddell's book, uh, Toward the United Front, I do really recommend you buy it, you, you, you read it and buy it. Um, uh, they, they refer to the, the workers' government, um, and it's particularly associated with figures such as Clara Zetkin um, and, and others, Ernst May and so on. Um, and I think it's an idea that we need to revisit um, because, well, for several reasons. I think the main reason is Syriza. Um, and I think the lesson of Syriza, and I think it's also the lesson actually of Venezuela, Bolivia and so on, uh, that today left-wing challenges which aren't simply the kind of inchoate, you know, occupy autonomist challenges, which I think, you know, perhaps we, we might agree on, on, on weaknesses, the strengths and weaknesses of those sorts of strategies, those sorts of practices, uh, the ones that can really challenge and really do challenge capitalist power, cha challenge the power of capital, tend to get channeled through uh, parliamentary institutions, tend to throw up an electoral challenge, tend to throw up, if they're successful, a governmental challenge. And I think we shouldn't run away from that. And I think that what the, again, I'm not bashing the SWP, but what the SWP tend to do is run away from this, tend to assert that, you know, the, the necessity of a revolutionary challenge, uh, which is left very abstract, I think, and which relies on a kind of magical thinking, where, you know, day-to-day -day struggle in whatever it, it is, you know, defend the right to, to work or, or, or unite the resistance and so on, somehow generates a system, a kind of embryonic workers' council system and throws up a revolutionary situation. Of course, there's quite a big leap there from the day-to-day -day struggles to the revolutionary situation. How do we get there? I think that's the unanswered question. I think it's, I think it's answered in the kind of abstract way, or it's not answered by many revolutionary socialists, people identify as revolutionary socialists. And I think we do need to go back to the debates uh, within the Comintern that, that John writes about, uh, where, where this problem was raised and addressed, I think, in a, in a straightforward and very honest way. Um, the basic idea is that we shouldn't be afraid of taking power. Um, you know, to talk about taking power on the left in Britain at the moment is, is, is a million miles away. But look, you know, in Greece, this is this is an immediate question that people have to face. And I think if ever there was a rise of the of the left, the radical left in Britain across the rest of the of West, Western Europe, we would be seeing a similar thing, which would be the rise of a party which you might call left reformist or centrist which is committed to both parliamentary channels and to extra-parliamentary channels, uh, which would, um, you know, which the strategy focuses on taking power within the capitalist state. If that is the, if that, those are the constraints we face, is that, if that's the realistic assessment of where left-wing struggle is likely to go today in Western European countries, we need to prepare ourselves thinking about, OK, how do we approach this? How do we afford, you know, uh, avoid the... We all know about the various reformist pitfalls that we'd face. How do we face the constraints that the capitalist state itself, the powers that work within it, the form it takes, imposes on socialist uh, activity? Um, very quickly, how, how long have I got? Have I been you've, got another, no, you've got another uh, uh, eight minutes or so. Oh, great, OK. That's more than I thought. That's good. Um, in the article that, that I, I published, I wanted to return to... Uh, Andre Gortz, um, who's associated with all sorts of bad things, and he, you know, so he wrote Farewell to the Working Class and so on, but he also came up with an extremely creative, thoughtful, very rich account of the relationship between reform and revolution. I also draw in a, in a, in a magazine uh, on Kagalitsky, and I'm, take, I'm, I'm kind of bashed for 
the, 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 uh, the apparent crimes of Kagalitsky, also in that book. But Gortz is perhaps a stronger figure to draw on. And he, he, he is associated with many things, but one of, the, one of the, the key concepts he's associated with, which I think is a, a really useful concept, is the idea of structural reforms. Uh, and structural form, reforms can be caricature, and there are various sorts that you can have. You can have a sort of a left social democratic form, uh, or you can have uh, a revolutionary form, a structural reform. And that's, the, that's, the, that's in, in, what, in what Gortz writes about in uh, Strategy for Labour and Socialism Revolution, I think, to, published in the late 60s, early 70s. He's trying to think through the relationship between <laughs> the struggle for reform uh, the implementation of reform by a left government, left government in inverted commas, um, forced on in a sort of dialectical relationship between a, a radical left wing government and a mass movement without outside the government kind of forcing it on. And the reforms that he talks about, structural reforms, are meant to build up the sort of ideological, psychological, material, uh, democratic capacities uh, and resources for the working class to then seize power in a, in a revolution. Uh, he wants to bridge the gap uh, between reform, the struggle for reform, and the point at which you might actually get to a you know, sort of feasible revolutionary situation. And, 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 and the solution is the idea of structural reforms. I won't go through this in too much detail, but um, he he argues that um, revolution can only emerge organically and dialectically through a process of struggle for reform. So revolutionary consciousness is built through a kind of pedagogical process of struggle for feasible objectives, feasible in inverted commas, uh, corresponding to the experience, needs and aspirations of workers. So at first these demands and aspirations and reforms will, from the standpoint of a generally reformist consciousness, which is, of course, most people, 99.9% .9 of people, uh, will appear legitimate within the system. They will, appear, they will appear achievable, just, necessary, but they won't necessarily seem to the people struggling for them to, uh, you know, kind of imply a change of system or, or imply a challenge to capitalism. But as this struggle develops, the anti-capitalist implications of the needs of those people struggling for those reforms uh, become revealed through the process of reform itself. Um, and so, through its experience of struggle and through its experience of trying to push uh, uh, you know, reforms on a government, trying to get them to implement these reforms, uh, it, uh, it educates itself and learns about its capacity for self-government. This, of course, depends on a left government perspective. Once you're talking about reforms, the struggle for reform, campaigning for reform, if we're talking about uh, a series of reforms, a programme of reforms, a series of uh, um, significant reforms, we're implicitly also talking about, you know, we need to think about what political instrument it is that actually implements those reforms, what puts those reforms into effect. And I think that is the big uh, black hole in the return to... Trotsky's notion of transitional demands that, that you see in, for, uh, for example, Alex Kalinikos in recent publications has, has returned quite interestingly to the notion of transitional reforms, drawing on Trotsky. And in one very interesting article in the ISJ, I think it's called Austerity Politics, published two or three years ago, he draws on um, uh, Kostas Lapovitsas and the, the group he works with at uh, the university, SOAS, he's employed at, a series of reforms that... Uh, they, they came up with to um, provide a sort of transitional program within Greece. And Alex pushes this forward. He, he's very much in favour of it. But the big question in the article is, well, who actually implements these reforms? In other publications, of course, Alex is talking about uh, the relationship between Antasia and Syriza and is against Syriza's left government perspective. He's against Antasia uh, supporting Syriza's call for a government of the left. And this is a, a clear contradiction. Who is it who, puts it who puts these transitional demands into effect? If you're not calling for a left government, what are you calling for? It's left completely, uh, it's, it's just circumspect, it's not addressed. And I think that's the big problem for, for, um, for, for, for Alex Kalinikos at the moment. Um, 
as, as John remarks in his in his in uh, in one of the articles on uh, his blog, you can also find it on thank you on the Links Journal. There are several articles there. If you search for John Riddell, he talks about the transitional program, uh, the, the, the 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 fourth Congress of the Comintern, the, the debate about the workers' government, and also about Syriza in relation to this. His uh, his 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 uh, um, comment is that demands for social reforms ring hollow unless capped by the perspective of a worker's political instrument to lead in carrying them out. Who actually carries out these reforms? A similar idea has been raised by Stathis Kouvalakis, who I think now is in the Central Committee, so he's uh, on the left of that party, and he's uh, argued in the past about the way in which the, the, the Leninist revolutionary strategy neglects the political, it doesn't have a political vehicle for, it, for the implementation of, of the reforms it seems to be pushing. Um, just to finish up on... And of course, John can talk about this much more uh, um, knowledgeably than me. And, and what I write about this in, in my article is drawn completely from, from John's book towards the, uh, towards the United Front. Um, what the uh, one of the one of the strange things about the SWP's version of Leninism is that it ignores uh, the, the ways in which. The Leninist, the, the Comintern under, under Lenin's leadership in the early 1920s, actually developed its own left government perspective. Actually moved from the the, the notion of transitional demands in the early 1920s. The, the the obvious conclusion they drew from the international context was that, whereas in say 1919, it looked feasible, it looked like there was an immediate prospect of revolution in, in many Western European countries. There were Soviets that existed often quite sophisticated organs of workers' democracy. By the early 1920s, these had largely disappeared, uh, and it moved towards a transitional demands perspective, and from there, people like Clara Zetkin, uh, and also Radek, uh, and others in the Bolshevik party, actually, uh, drew the necessary conclusion from that, which is that if you're going to call for transitional demands, you also need to call for a workers' government. So within that, actually within the Leninist tradition, I'm not a Leninist, but within the Leninist tradition, there are the resources to, uh, to, to, to um, conceive of the possibility and necessity of a left government. And that's, I suppose, where I want to uh, leave the uh, talk. Thank you.